Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the David Mead Podcast. On today's episode, we have Marcus Bai. Marcus is a PNG Kumuls legend and a Melbourne Storm legend. He's also a great family man and a great friend. Marcus, thanks to you for uh, coming on the podcast, mate. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. We met during the 2008 World Cup and we've been pretty good friends since. Uh, the guys I speak to who know you well as well uh, say the same thing. And I know uh, that a lot of people know you, and you know a lot of people as well. Uh, <laughs> have you always been the type of person that keeps in contact with people, or was it something that um, was it a skill that you had to develop? Because the older I get, the like people like yourself and others, they tell me this is a good skill to have because later on down the track you'll be f- you'll be friends for life. So, have you always been that type of person? Um, no. Um, look, when I was growing up, I was. Um you know, very shy person, um, and and my kids got it now as well. I can't I can't get them out, out of it. Um, obviously, I was shy until I think it changed when I went to Melbourne uh, 90, 90, um, 98, where it comes to a, a team meetings and and I don't say much in meetings. And um, um, Chris Anderson and I think probably third game or fourth game into the uh, season, and. Chris Anderson and Steve Anderson pulled me in and, uh, and and have a chat with me about not involving in in the verbal uh, communication with uh, with uh, with the players. They asked me to start talking and and obviously put myself out there so that so that um, you know the rugby league itself is the team is about a team. It's not about one person. I I found it really difficult because as I was growing up, also I was always a shy person in terms of um, within. I only t- say much within my family, not people that I don't don't know. Yeah. And obviously got some some insight from you know um, Tower and Nico had had a bit of that and start talking to me to build my confidence and he said, you know Tower has said to me if you can play if you can come in and take the ball forward and aggressive like that then you can start you know expressing it. Within the within the group, that way your participation within the group is as well. The players will get to know you, and and I think one thing one thing on that is because my English wasn't that good as as you know we uh, finished grade ten in Papua New Guinea in eighty nine and um, and go back home and and work in in in, in dads uh, not only dads but it's the village uh, with the company in the village uh, UDC Ulamana Development Corporation and. During that time in 1990, when I finished school, and and the people around us was the people that we know when you know we speak openly. But when we get out, we some of us were that shy. I, it changed that in 2018. Uh, sorry, sorry, not 2018. Uh, 1998, with the culture that the Melbourne were building that time, and and um, uh, late Mick Moore, Mick Moore was there, and he basically played a massive part in. You know, saying things about me about Papua New Guinea that makes me—it's a—it's—it's it's fun, but it makes me defend it, and I and I talk more about Papua New Guinea, who we are, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, and I started to know uh, uh, Tracy, his wife, and and the kids, and the, the two daughters, and and um, the son, and and that's the relations started to grow from there, and and that's how. That's how I started to have that confidence in talking with, and obviously having good friends. Um, as halfway of the season went, and good friends with Aaron Mill, Matt Dyer, and the whole of the uh, the old boys. Um, and still, still, my talking within the um, within the uh, the team meetings were no no very very limited. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just one of those things that it started from there and Chris warned me, Chris Anderson warned me, he said, you need you need to talk. If you don't talk, you're not here in this club. And that was the turning point of of my career where when I was talking to my big brother, Stanis, he said to me, well, you need to put in put in an effort in what you think about the game. You need to put into the group. If you don't, well, that's not participation. And, man, you know, I've got seven other br- seven brothers that, um, you know, they obviously been successful within their own rights, and they all say the same thing, and that really changed me from them. Because a lot of uh, players I find, specific, uh, specifically, uh, you know, Pacific Islanders or I uh, you know PNG players in particular, very shy to express their views uh, in the team environment. Obviously, we all grow up in that 
environment. You know, we're pretty comfortable with now in the village setting within our family as soon as we're taken out. In a work environment, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty important to express your uh, opinion, express yourself around the, especially work environment or sporting teams. Do you think that's an important skill to develop? Yeah, that's the biggest issue with you know um, within our PNG boys, and uh, and I know it goes through the South Pacific Islander boys who grew up in the islands, and uh, not so much maybe in New Zealand who grew up there and here in here in Australia. But uh, to our to our boys in Papua New Guinea, as you know from the Kumul from the Kumul uh, aspects of it, when since two thousand sixteen, and the hunters are having the same 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 issue where. Our boys need to stand up, and and it's not so much stand up. They they need to to address their view in in a group in a group meeting, yep. in terms of say what they think, so that the coaches can see where where the boys are. Uh, when they don't say much, and if only two people talking, uh, and I I can feel for Matt Church, yep. he can't get he can't be communicating. And he's trying to do extra work to be able to communicate with um, um, uh, with the boys. That is an issue. How we're gonna solve it? Um, it's up to it's up to those boys. If they wanna they wanna play in NRL, um, those are the things that those are the requirements. They they need to put themselves out there, not to talk so much, but to ask questions. Yeah. Um, if they're having issues, they need to talk about it. Uh, it's okay. As what I hear, it's okay to come out and and talk to the coach about what the issue is, so that the coach and the management team can solve the problem. Um, and even though that's that's in the hunters, um, and it's same in same as well in in the Kumuls. Yeah. And only yourself and and the Australian based players will say much, and maybe us the boss and. And and few other boys, few other boys will not say much. Yeah. Um, but the PNG boys who've now been into Australia and England, and that they will say their view, which is um, which is which is good. But I I just hope that they start doing that in the Digicel Cup, and when they do it in the Digicel Cup, then and they come to the Hunters, it's another step up to uh, a bigger understanding of wha- where the interest Super Cup is going. Yeah. The more they ask questions, the more th- they're gonna get answered. Yeah. And then the more they how they wanted to play. I knew that because during my time, I, I had the same thing. I had the, all these things that all through the year, I never said it to anybody. Yeah. And I I had that relationship with um, um, Steve Anderson, who's our assistant coach, and Gregory uh, Brennell, where I let everybody, all the players left for home in the afternoon, then I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll sit for an hour and a half or two hours, then I'll go and see Steve and the ask me, hey, Steve, you know, um, I find it hard to understand what we talked about today. Yeah. Can you explain to, so that I can understand it? And then Steve will end- explain. Steve, Steve Anderson actually coached me the whole time that I was there. Um, he coached me after, after hours, and we're still good friends now. Um, I still ask for his opinion about things. He's a very smart man. Uh, rugby league, he knows in and out of rugby league. He's someone that that I think that will educate our Papua New Guinea young boys because through the three years, the four years I've been with him, he knew me from inside and out yeah. and took out the bad stuff of Papua New Guinea that I have and educate me into knowing the game itself. And I'm still learning as I went because Obviously, I didn't. I didn't start playing, yeah. playing rugby league till I was what finished school in eighty nine, seventeen, eighteen year old. That's when I started. That's playing. when you started. Um, a bit of a later age to start then. Yeah. When you start this. Yeah. But let, let's talk a little bit about um, where you were born in PNG and uh, what was it like growing up there. Yeah, I was born in um, a, a little village. Uh, original name was Ubili, Ubili village, but the Germans. Uh, came in to colonize, obviously, the village uh, uh, and brought Catholic church there. Um, they changed the name to Ulamona, Ulamona, which is now represent our area. About 2,000 people living there at the moment, maybe 2,000 plus. Um, I was brought up in a, you know, a, a family of 10, um, mom and dad, subsistence farming. Uh, dad, as an 18-year-old, 
um, work with the Catholic missionaries, you know, sweep the floor uh, as a start, and then uh, cleaning the you know the German German the missionaries, the brothers, the priests, the nuns, clean the house, flower beds, um, clean that, uh, cut the lawns, and mm. during those times, uh, you know, they got a long grass knife, yeah. and, and he's a that was a very hard working guy, and he spent. As an 18-year-old until I was born in 72, until I think 75 or 76, he he, he retired as a, as working for, for Catholic missionaries. And, um, so when he retired in 75, I think it was 74, the Catholic missionaries gave him some money to be able to start a shop, start a, a shop in the village as they helped him to build up this shop called Ulamona Development Corporation where... He during the time seventy six they started and during the time he he advised everyone to be the shareholder ten kina as the shares into the company that the company owned by mm-hmm. everyone everyone in the village. Anyway, um, why why he started business is because uh, we got a sawmill logging logging has been going on uh, has been been German mis- Catholic Church has been harvesting logging for since ni- eighteen eighty five. So 1985, I was in grade six. Was the hundred years of logging in our in our village. So and that's why the German missionaries were there and supply all the sawn timbers to Rabaul, East New Britain, the whole of New of New Britain Island, yeah. uh, to Kaviang, to Manus, and and, and Bougainville, etc. Um, yeah. Well, we had obviously I got ten ten in a family, eight eight boys and two girls, brought up in a village way, and dad was a very tough man. Um, everything is about time. Everything is about. So you sweat, you get a reward. You don't sweat, you don't get a reward. Um, you you do something wrong, you build the crap out of you. Mm. Um, it leads to all my brothers been successful. My two sisters been successful, and and so to so me, hard, was, hard work, discipline. Oh, that is being on time. Work. I'll just give an example. We finish school in on Friday, and during the week, if he says to us. Um, um, you three boys, Leonard, Fred, and Marcus. If you finish from uh, from school at three o'clock, three thirty, you should be at um, help um, walking up to to this area where your mother will be, and carry all the firewood and all the stuff back home to the village, mm-hmm. uh, back to the house. You don't do that. You don't eat in the afternoon, and trust me, you don't eat in the afternoon. Mom will save our food, and mom is always a mom. <laughs> mom is always as a mother. Yeah. They'll save the food and then dad will take our plate out and toss it out into the dogs, his hunting dogs. And we'll be sitting there, tears in the table while well, every uh, um, others, you know, mm. uh, all our other, uh, other brothers eat. Teach us, a, teach us a lesson that you listen, um, you do, you work hard. As he said, you sweat, you get a reward. Yeah. But mom, mom always put spare <laughs> on the side to come up and when dad is asleep, he comes up and said, hey, hurry up and eat it and uh, then you can go to bed. So we we all grew up in that, and honestly, honestly, growing up, at times, you know, to myself, I thought, you know, dad is a cruel person, because I didn't see what he was planning for. Then when I went to grade six in eighty five, uh, he said to me, "You need to go to, you must go to high school. If you don't go to high school, there's no point living in my house." And when he talks to me, his eyes were. Tell the story. Mm-hmm. There is no but. You you must make it. Those are his ways. At times when I was growing up, and even my brother said, "Oh, he's he's harsh. You know, he's mm-hmm. he's too hard on us." And to where I'm sitting today, I have a you know a wife and and three great kids, healthy. My career, it's not on some. It's not on anybody else. It's my old man and my my mom. Yeah. My mom support her to make it work, even though she was, as a mother, put a little, little bit of things on the side for us to eat. You know, mothers will not see a, a son or a daughter. Daughter get hungry. Yeah. Um, but dad was a very tough man. And and I know uh, our, our guys in the village will be looking at this, and he said what I said is 100%. Uh, that's the 100% truth. Yeah. As in the village, they call him the big boss. He is the chief. He is the last chief in the village. Yeah. Um, when he says something, everybody follows. I don't know how he did it. Um, 
it's just the trust in the village that everyone, everyone in the village of 1,500 or, or 900, less than 2,000 people just listen to him because he is the person. Because when he says something, he goes ahead and he does it. Everybody sees him, everybody follows. And because he worked with the Catholic missionaries for, for a long period of time, they have the trust. Everything they're going to, the Catholic church will give it to the village. They go through my dad to explain it to everybody in the village. So therefore, all the elders in the village made him as the chief in the village. And he was the last, as we call it, the last chief in the village. And uh, looking back at it now, um, his success, his hard discipline has made pathways for me in life. Mm -hmm. um, that to me, you know, I tip, my, I tip my head to him. Every time I go back there, I'm a bit emotional, but every time I get back there, I'll go to his grave and... You know, just kick the dead there, and he said, "You know, dead thanks." Mm. There's nothing else to say. Yeah. Um, so I got great kids and 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 family and 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 my wife and and more people that I know. It's like the question you ask: um, How do you started to know these people? It's just over the after '98 season with Melbourne Storm, I started to gain confidence in talking to people. And, and I know, and, and still now, my wife will say, everybody will go to the dressing room and, and have a shower and come out and go and see them. I'll be still waiting for another hour because I'm that slow at coming out and shaking hands with people and paying that respect to the fans who come out. And then I'll be in the um, clubhouse shaking hands with everyone and she'll come and take my bag. And as because we were brought up in that respect arena mm -hmm. in our family, you don't walk away from that. Yeah. Ever. Even though I was, what, 2,000 kilometers from my father, he was still alive at that time. It, it stuck in my, it's in my blood. I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't get it out. It's very stay with you. Yeah, like, you know, these people drunk, really drunk. He said, hey, Mark, you know, blah, you know, they come up and hug me and I said, hey, how are you? And I have time. And years after, when I left Melbourne in 2003, went to England and come back for, you know, some family uh, Melbourne asked me to come back just to come up and spend a day or so, uh, old boys and that. Those people comes back, comes back and said, you know what? You know, you, you're still my favorite player. I said, why is that? My, that's a that's long time ago. And he said, no, nah, you have time for us. Mm. I said, my wife, one time, and they talking about the date, the game, I couldn't even remember those, those games. He said, why is that? And he said, oh, even my daughter was five, she's now have kids, her room still filled with your photos. And I said, why? Take it down. I said, tell the husband to take yeah. it down. And and they said, no. Nah. I said, you're one of those players where you have time for us. And again, I'll go back to my old man for that teaching me, teaching us that respect. Yeah. And when we were growing up, he, he basically planned that in our, in, our, in our minds that you need to have respect. Yeah. You know? And I know my boys, if they see this, they, my three boys will see this. And he said, yeah, he's going to say the three words. <laughs> um, Dad always say to us, you know, respect, honesty, and trust. And my, my son, Esten, said, why do you put him in a line like that? And I said, because Dad, sa Dad always say, when you respect someone, you return the respect. And then when you, when you respect, you're honest with somebody. You're honest with somebody. Somebody will give you that honesty back. And then the trust follows it as well. Yeah. When you have that, you got good family. When you have that, you got people will look at you and they respect, they honest, they honest to you, and they'll be trustworthy to you. Yeah, and that goes through our family, and and hopefully it goes through our our extended family. But for my three boys, that will not go away. That will stay within them, and it's paying off, paying off within the school, and 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 hopefully they can continue what. Our old man, what my old man has done to us, yeah. And all I want is my three, my three boys to to be able to do that. And that's that's an awesome story with you know filled with so many good values, so many good um, lessons for you know, a lot of families out there. What last night I was watching on on YouTube uh, this American guy's reactions to the PNG and crime, the crime in PNG, and how the people are brought up. Just seeing his reaction, thinking, man, where is this place? How is this happening? And how are people... Obviously, the cameras, the documentaries focus just on that part of 
mm. PNG. So I got I got to see just that side of PNG, just the a lot of, a lot of the crimes that are happening. Yeah, and you just see the videos. Um, you know, people the people who are committing the crimes, they're they're just trying to they're trying to provide for themselves and for their families. You know, it, it's obviously bad to do and. But at the end of the day, they're trying to provide for themselves, look after themselves, and that's that's the way they've found to do it. Uh, where I'm leading towards this is, you know, your dad must have known you need to do this ty- kind of stuff so you can stay away from, you know, that type of lifestyle. And I, f- I find that with a lot of um, you know guys that I've spoken to, having those good family values, that respect, trust, leadership within their family is really important to stay away from that, be- away from the crimes because. I don't know what the employment uh, opportunity is after you finish school in PNG. I think the numbers are very low, uh, especially from when you graduate from uni, doesn't guarantee a job. So I think your dad must have known you need to do this and this needs to be a part of your DNA. Look, that, up. That, that comes from a family of his father. He's a hard man as well. He's, he's tough. And when we, when we say, you and I say tough, uh, Everyone in Papua New Guinea know exactly what we're talking about. Tough means get a cane out and smack the crap out of your kids. Mm. But dad, dad always say, Marcus, I may not see see your kids grow up or you might, because I invited him for my wedding. He didn't come because he doesn't think that the plane will stay up in the air for that long. <laughs> <laughs> for that long. So um, he's still living in the, um, in the 40s, I think. <laughs> But um, but that always say this. I remember this. I remember this, and this would be passing to my boys. Is that always say, teach your kids when they have not start talking yet. And I said, why is that? Well, I do that. I did that to you boys, to your kids. Now going back to the crimes and in Papua New Guinea, that's that's how we live. Mm. Um, some of us, you and I. Justin Olam, Johnny Wilshire, we were lucky, brought up in in, a, in the family. It was tough, but not so tough than two million of other kids, yep. three million of other kids in in, in, in our country. Um, and then they are brought up in Mosby where their moms and dads are not, you know, w- not with good money. So what do you do? They have six six boys and and, and, and kids, you know. Uh, they go to they go to, they gotta go and do something. They know it's they know it's wrong. Yeah. Right? They still they do it. A lot of them get killed by the by the police, and and but at the end of the day, you know, it's a big challenge to our government, and and I know they are working hard to try and and minimize 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 those um those issues, and you know, I mean, f- for me, to me, I look back at it as in Australia, it's a developed country, and we're still developing, and you got the kids from grade go to a school from grade or prep all the way up to grade twelve. In Papua New Guinea, we don't have that luxury. Our, our curriculum and, and, and all that in education is different. It brings out the, the great kids who are very knowledgeable in Papua New Guinea, but it's only a minority. Yeah. The rest, maybe 80% of that, goes back home and chew betel nut and uh, smoke. And and maybe another 30% will do other things that in the mines and, and do trade and all. Um, yeah, it's a, honestly... It's a very hard thing for everyone, and all we can do is, you know, for us as rugby league, um, um, uh, ex rugby league, and yourself still playing, and um, uh, for us is to get that message out there to our young boys and young girls. If we can make it that hard from the village, coming from the village, and and making it up here, you know, and and change our lives within, you know, five or ten years of working hard, you know, I I know they can do it as well. Yeah. Um, like I said. I learned my English on the on the way, even though I still can't speak English properly. But as my boy said to me, Dad, speak English. And I said, I don't care what you guys say. <laughs> but that's what it is. And th- that's who I am. And uh, and they know that. And 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 hopefully, you know, hopefully the um, the PNG government can, can reach out to us as ex-NRL players or current players to be able to come back. And they set up some... There's a lot of trade schools in Papua New Guinea where where the kids can go, but the big problem is the parents don't have the money to pay for the school fees. 
So that is another massive problem. Then obviously, you know, young girls, um, sometimes they don't, in the villages I know, in the village, where, in our village where young girls will not go to school, even, the, the, even though they're so smart, but limitations of uh, money to be able to, to pay school fees, um, budget, things like that in the villages. We talk about budget, but in the, in the villages, you know what village life is like. Yeah. You don't have a wallet. You have cash in you from oil palm, from cocoa, from uh, coconut. You harvest it. You go to the town and everything finishes. Maybe the next two days the money is finished. Mm -hmm. There's no budget. Um, those are the things that um, if the people in the village are watching uh, are watching uh, a David Midpower podcast, podcast, really, really think about when they have money, put it in the bank and start a small business for themselves to be a business that they can handle, yeah. not not business that they cannot handle because they saw one of their friends is doing it, they can do it. It doesn't work that way. Or even go to a business college business and, and learn how to do spreadsheet and, and the little things about business just to have a, have a ticket to be able to help them how they can manage their money and budget their money, the profit and et cetera, et cetera. Because we know, and I know, in the villages, they get the money, and obviously they go to little trade stores and and sell beer, and then the money comes in next minute. You know, all I and I'm talking like I'm I'm talking at the moment, currently talking that way. But there's our cousins and niece and nephews, especially nephews. They got big tummies, bellies about nearly to be explode mm. because they don't use the money wisely. Um, it's that discipline of discipline of whatever you do in obviously us in rugby league, but as well in Anything that you do is discipline to be able to to earn good money for your family and then expand it into a, a slightly bigger as the as the as the years comes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. You know, you get the slightest chance or slightest sniff of you know making your life better you know, in any area, whether it be you know career wise, um, sport, uh, anything. You know, if, if someone gives you a broom to sweep the front of the store. And that that can give you a opportunity to you know probably work in that shop one day. You know, just doing something like that, rather you know staying out of the mm. village and you know having those types of friends around that you know probably push you in the way of you know crimes. Because I was uh, I was twelve years old or you know even younger. I had a lot of friends. You know, were fighting, you know, stealing, you know, going to the shop stealing like biscuits and stuff like that. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in that type of uh, environment, especially if. You're, um, Family is not working, or you know anything like that. So if you get a slightest chance of uh, you know opportunity to make your life better, run with it and you know and don't look back. Definitely, definitely. Let's talk a little bit about your rugby league career. This is a chat mainly outside of rugby league, but I just want to talk a little bit about it. Uh, do you remember your first grade debut? The the moment you got told you're gonna um, play that weekend. Yeah, it was uh, it was here on the Gold Coast, and um, I think against um, not Sydney Bears. Um, obviously, uh, uh, Tommy O'Reilly, Tommy O'Reilly, and myself were playing in reserve grade um, that year '97, and and it was good. You know, I, it was good that um, I came to the Gold Coast Charges when uh, Tommy was there, and uh, he got me in. Basically, he he looked after me, to be honest, and that's why we're good friends now. Uh, the reason is because I have a lot of respect from him from the beginning. My career blossomed from there as to my 10 years. I can say the hard work, but he made me feel welcome on the Gold Coast, took me around the Gold Coast, make me feel at home. He played a massive part in me. Obviously, I was in England the year before, but Stanley, Stanley Gainer and John O'Cole was there, so uh, you know, another two country countrymen, um, country legends there. I came up here, I didn't know anybody until one of the guys said to me, look, Tommy Riley is, um, is half PNG and Baba Corey. And I said, oh, great. I said, then the next day I went to training. He was there. He came, walked straight in, shook my hands. Hey, wait, what part of um, New Guinea are you from? Are you from the islands? I said, yeah. And we just kicked off straight from there. And that relationship will never be broken, ever, ever. Tom went through some hard times in in his in his time when I finished career, and he's always in my house, you know, drinking, having a beer, having a, and Tom loves the cooking and all that. My kids grow up uh, knowing Tommy, like Uncle Tom, and 
and he's now back on the Gold Coast again. But yeah, I think one of our <coughs> we we're watching watching a game the weekend before, and um, and Shane Russell, one of the wingers, he broke his ankle, and Tommy uh, rang me and he said to me, "Hey, uh, you might have a go here." And he said, "Oh, we'll see on ma- on Monday or Tuesday." And then on Tuesday, Phil Economy this. Um, Actually, it started, started off with Scott Settler came, came, coming over and coming over, you know, he's, he's, Scotty is always steady, you know, ar- around the training area. And, and he said, hey, I think you might have a go here. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, Shane Russell is injured and you, you might have a I said, oh, there's other wingers as well. He said, um, anyway, comes on a Tuesday, on a Tuesday, um, Tuesday morning uh, afternoon when we train at Carrara and feel... Um, called me in. He said to me to come in at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock was the training, and Phil said to me, look, Shane is injured, so you're playing good in uh, reserve grade. You might have a chance to to play in uh, in first grade this year. And uh, I said, do I have a chance, or am I playing in first grade uh, uh, this week? I said, no, you're playing in first grade this week. Congratulations. Oh, man, I nearly cried. Um, uh, I walked outside, and went to the little, went to the car that the the club gave me. Opened, it, open it, open the car. Get my Nokia, Nokia, the old Nokia's, yeah. <laughs> and dial my brother's number. And I couldn't get through because there wasn't any any um, there wasn't any credit uh, credit <laughs> in it. And I keep blaming. Now I remember that time. I, the Tommy came over and he said, "I just heard that you you made oh congratulations." He said, "Oh Tom, thank thank you so much." I feel bad because. They didn't say anything about Tom, as you know, coming from uh, like you want your mate to be there, but mm-hmm. it's not the way it is. And um, and then I think a week later, Tommy came and joined us, and we never looked back from then. And um, I was lucky to um, to play on the wing and outside um, um, Graham Mackay. So Graham Mackay, I think it was Graham Mackay or um, West Patton. Uh, West Patton put out a cut out pass and then Graham Mackay, because he's a big man, played in the centers and just offloaded this ball. And I got Chris Caruana standing in front of me and all I went up and went out and stepped big left foot step, step in. And the try line was only like five meters away. It was the first touch of the ball. Went went and scored. Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah, good. Um oh, it was so good. Um I still still remember the day out. I, I walked out and and uh I was so happy. Anyway, that night, I that night when they told me on Tuesday that I'm in the first grade, I rang my brother from Tommy's phone. <laughs> Tommy's still complaining today that uh, the bill was still there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I rang my brother and I said, "I'm on. I'll um, I'll be playing in first grade today, and we'll be on Channel Nine on uh, Channel Nine on a Friday. I think it was a Friday." And um, he actually, there's only one phone in the village, so he rang the uh, the German missionary's uh, phone phone number and and told one of our officers, one of our, con- our cousins there that um, I'll be on the, um, I think it was on a Friday night. So they had to hire, 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 you know, big trucks, you know, the, the 10 wheelers, the big trucks that carry oil palm and, yeah. and gravel and all that. They hired, they hired a 250 kina to take the whole heap of boys and girls to go to town in Biela town, just to look for, look for TV, to watch, watch a game out there. Um, it was good. It was good. That, that week they told me, said, oh, it's so good to uh, to watch, to see you play on TV. You're, you're one of us. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of tears. Eh? My sister was crying, you know, when I was talking to them. I was in tears and, and my cousins were in tears. And so that we, we follow rugby league with, you know, Canberra Riders and Balmain Tigers during the time of, you know, Canberra was winning majority of the um, the, the finals and all that. And, Lori Daly and Ricky Stewart and and Bradley Clyde, Mel Meninga and all these you know uh, legends and um, it was it was really good that um, to play against the guys that um, I idolize from watching over every Saturday we hire a car or Sunday we hire a car to go to the town just to watch the game put SP on the um, on the uh, SP on um, on the car and on the truck and then drive back home standing up for one hour all the way back <laughs> to the village. Um, yeah, that was that was the best life. Uh, looking back at it now, that was the best life ever. Uh, to be honest, yeah, nothing to worry about. Uh, we stand at the backs, just stand, hold on to the walls of the truck, having a beer and through it, 
you know, throwing the throwing the bottles over that during those times where, mm. you know, now that uh, the boys can, you know, can just stand on the TV from the you know from the from the houses and watch a game, and I remember those days. But um, it was a special, it was a special, it was a special time, and um, I think the following week we played uh, Roosters. That's when yeah. I, I was looking forward to the game because to play against Adrian and um, Let me and, and Adrian was our you know, obviously we look up on Adrian. Nineteen ninety four, he played in the in the state of origin, and mm-hmm. you know Adrian play a part, massive part in my in my career in in introducing Sam Ayub as my manager for five years there, for basically the whole ten years. Uh, Sam look after me, and and thanks to a- Adrian for. For watching of you know what we are doing now to our uh, hunters boys and the Kumuls. Yeah. You know, it started from from long time ago and Adrian play a massive part in looking after myself, Stanley and and John O'Cool during that time and then the, the boys underneath it, boys under under us, we decided to try and help them as well. And yeah. Johnny Wilshire and his brother William Wilshire, they you know, they spent a lot of time with the Kumuls as well. So Yes, pass it forward. Yes. Um you spent uh, time in Melbourne, uh, and you always speak highly of that club. Um, to you, what makes them so special? Can I can I start by saying everything in Melbourne was taken from the Brisbane Broncos, and they planted the seed in Melbourne. When you look at the person who started Melbourne, it's John Rebo. John Ribo was part and parcel of Brisbane Broncos, success success of Brisbane Broncos. John Ribo came to Melbourne. He brought with him Chris Jones, legend at the Broncos, and, and a rugby league legend as well. And he brought Mick Moore, who is as a copa and a late Mick Moore is a copa and part of part of uh, the Broncos as well in terms of the people around Wayne Bennett. Uh, Bob Bennett and the family, and and makes that 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 was the culture. Mm-hmm. And I remember, and and not a word of a lie, every Melbourne Storm players during that ninety eight season, and ninety nine season, and in the old days, and even Cameron, Will Smitty, and all these boys will know, will know that most of the things came from the Brisbane Broncos. N- I've never seen players. Ex players from Melbourne talks about this, but I'll say this: every administration in Melbourne Storm during that time, ninety percent of them came from the Brisbane Broncos. John Ribo, Chris Jones, M- Michael Moore, the development guys—they all come from Brisbane Broncos. Everything, and, I, and, I, and I'll say this, David: in the nineteen fifty-six Olympic Arena, where it used to be Olympic Park. And their building was was there before they demolished it and now build it, obviously Amy Stadium and mm-hmm. you know the new. Now in there was a, there is a there is a meeting place underneath underneath the car park, which and then you go up to to the gym, our gym and and all that. Every wall, every wall, every wall around our training, our training um, a facility. Where the gym and and the gym and where we eat and everything, it was big, big photos of Brisbane Broncos players. Glenn Lazarus was with us, but Glenn Lazarus and Andrew G, Wendell Saylor, uh, Michael Hancock, Willie Khan, Kevin Walters, all these big name players who were with the Broncos, Chris Jones. We were Melbourne Storm, but the surrounding around us was all all Brisbane Broncos. And no older players will say that I, I'm 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 telling lies here. That is the fact. We walked in on the seventh, sorry, on the ninth ninth of November, nineteen ninety seven. And John Ribo said to us, "We're gonna build this club like the Brisbane Broncos." At the end of his speech, he said, "We're gonna be successful because." We're gonna take what's in the Broncos and we're gonna put it here and we're gonna build it here as a family club. And that family club from the Broncos is gonna be here. That's it. 
the culture, the structures, uh, Steve Anderson um, was part and parcel of the coaching and, and the CEO helping Chris Jones to be able to work to work within um, the administration of, of Melbourne. For the whole 12 months of 1998, from 9th of November till till the November 1998, it was all Brisbane Broncos. You know, by the time we started winning and winning, and then when we lost, we lost in the finals against the Brisbane Broncos, 36-6 or eight or something in the first our, our first ever final. We came back and obviously met Monday was up. So the boys said, "Hey, we're gonna get rid of this um, Brisbane Broncos. They they beat us pretty badly, eh?" Next now next year now let's start the let's start the Melbourne Storm. You know, you know, obviously. But but basically everything was came from John Rebo and Chris Jones and the people who got involved and the chairman chairman of, of the club and you know people who were successfully with the Broncos during their time in the early nineties and um, they built they built uh, Brisbane Broncos went to Melbourne and built built Melbourne. Same thing, yeah. Uh, psychologist that was with the, with Wayne Bennett for a long time as well. He came up in the first couple of years to be able to help us, you know, with the, to help us within the place. I know I've been part of it and and I think Craig Bellamy coming from the Broncos with that with that structure and the strong and the winning the winning structure, the winning um, um, uh, system that he had, he came in with he doesn't have to look far when the same structures I suppose coming from the Broncos to the Melbourne, it was everything was the same. All you have to do is, you know, uh, but you know he, he worked harder than anybody I I know to be able to build uh, to build that club for what he wanted. To me, to myself, thinking about it, he came in and and the training was was the precision training that I that I had with him. It was it was tough. It was very tough. And Matt guy said to me, it was tougher the years after that. Just the way, and obviously coming from Canberra and, and and then going spending how many three years with the Broncos and then coming to Melbourne, he had all the winning, he had all the winning culture in him. Yeah. Uh, and when he came to Melbourne, now he's the boss. You know, he put all those um, I suppose good seeds into the young players that that, that was coming up. Lucky enough, well, I, I shouldn't say lucky enough, but all the players during our time that the six six years were going down and then you got um, you know uh, Cameron Smith was 20 years old coming up Billy Slater Ryan Hoffman um, Nathan Friend um, Dallas Johnson all these players um, and 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 a whole heap of them coming from uh, 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 Devils um, not Devils and they all come up and he had this thing about I remember Craig saying to me, saying to us, "We're gonna pick the second tier and the third tier players. That's fine, but we're gonna work with what we got. Otherwise, we're gonna be spending a lot of money to try and buy players. I'm not gonna do that. We're gonna build the players. That was how many years ago? That was what twenty? Uh, what eighteen, nineteen, maybe twenty years ago? Nineteen yeah. years ago. It's now nineteen. 19 years? Mm -hmm. That was 19 years ago. Still doing the same thing. Yeah, and the same thing. Players go there and they, they just flourish there. Yeah. Go from other other teams, get there and... they uh, To me, anyway, they look like they're just on a new level to like where they were at previous clubs. To, to be honest, that's that's from the winning culture that Craig from Canberra to Brisbane as coach. And then when he came to Melbourne, it's the same thing that you see, but probably even better with John Rebo as a player. Chris Chris Jones wasn't there, but um, the CEO was there and was, everybody were, they're all players. By the time he came in, they were all players, a lot of players within within the office of, of Melbourne. Yeah. Um, which they know what, what to come. And, and But as well, you know, with, with us players, Glenn Lazarus and Tower Nikau leading the, leading the um, and as we say, you know, uh, stay within the, um, stay within the group and not individually. And then when they left, and then Stephen Kenny came in '99, and and Robbie Kens, they were the leaders, and Robbie Ross, and they were the leaders of us, you know, going forward from then. And and obviously Stephen Kenny and and Robbie Kens left in 2004, maybe five. Mm -hmm. 
And by then, they already built, you know, Cameron Smith and Matt Gaia was still there, uh, having to be able to put in place. That that Khalsa was driven by then the upcoming, you know, with Cameron Smith, Billy Slater, Ryan Hoffman, all these boys have learned from those from those players. Yeah. And and obviously Ryan Hoffman, the connection with his father, with uh, knowing Craig, and that relationship and the family bonding bonding was was that strong. They go in and they work hard. They didn't ask for big money until they start representing, uh, representing obviously New South Wales, Queensland, and then you know obviously they deserve that. And yeah, and that's how it's supposed to be, I think. Yeah, for sure. Let's change uh, direction just a little bit. Uh, for those that who don't know you, uh, you know, I don't want to embarrass you by you no, know, no, no. bringing up some of your achievements. Um, oh. Yeah, because <laughs> I know you've got a lot of them. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that you're you know one of the few players. I was looking up. I didn't even realize I was looking uh, looking up on Wikipedia uh, a few days ago. Uh, you're one of few players who has won an NRL Premiership, a Super League title, a World Club Challenge, and the only top trophy that you could win in at, at this level is the Challenge Cup, uh, in which I read that you know Hal FC scored with a uh, minutes yeah. to go. Uh, you know, when you think about that, it's a pretty amazing achievement, um, especially when um, a young kid coming from where you came from. Uh, in PNG, and not there's no real pathways that were I'd imagine were in place for young players to go to a next level. I think I saw on an MTV interview you did that. There was a little article written about you, and then someone saw that and got you to go play for the um, was it the Vipers? The Parga Parga Panthers. Parga, Parga Panthers, yeah. and that's kind of where it it took off. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about it like that? I. I said it so many times. I think when the when uh, in Melbourne uh, through the um, documentary, the Channel Line documentary, when they did a story on me, and um, and I sort of mentioned that was the probably only time, pro- probably the second time was in England, when when I went to Bradford and um, they did a story on someone who was very interested about the, my past. Um, yeah, well, same like you said. You know, I was playing playing in the village and um, in the in the town. There's only the, the town competition started in 1990, and then from 1988 to 1990, and then, as you know, administration, um, you know, went somewhere, um, and then they started again into in in 1994. And one of our one of our guys from Biala area area uh, is working for Post Korea, and he was on holiday, and he came up watched a Sunday game and saw the saw the game, and I think he must have scored two tries to be to win that game from our from the the village the club that I play for in the village anyway he wrote a little probably uh, I'll say about about my finger of the local leagues around Papua New Guinea you still see on post Korea they still put that local leagues now it's gone a little bit bigger yeah. but during the time it was only probably three lines and my brother my my mother my uh, sister-in-law saw it reading the paper and he rang my brother and he said uh, hey Marcus' name was on the paper that he scored two tries or three tries or whatever it is. So my brother had a look at it and he said, I'm going to give him a call. He said, he might come and play for Paga Pentes here. I said, would you, uh, would you want him to come? He said, yeah, bring him over here. Anyway, he rang, he rang up and he said to me, do you want to come and play in, in Mosby? And I said, no. And he said, just, okay, I'll do a deal. Come here for three months. No, I'm not coming for two, three months. Okay, just come for two months. If you make it, you stay with me in our house. If you don't make it, you go back home. And I said, okay, I'll ask Dad first. So I walked home and asked Dad. He said, Dad, Stanley said um, he wants me to go to Mosby and, and trial. My dad looked at me, looked at me up and down and up and down, and I know the answer is no. He said, um, you're going to... Is he going to give you something in life later on? I said, probably not. Well, you know the answer. Okay. Tomorrow I'll go back to the um, Catholic mission area and I'll ring Stanis. Next day I went back and asked the boys to ring my brother and then and I said, Dad said no. And he said, no, you tell him, uh, you've got money, yeah? And I said, I've got coconut plantation there. Or you going to collect it? He said, Dad said no. And he said, don't worry about that. And I said, no. Dad said, no. 
And he said, um, why? He said, because he said, it's not going to help me later on in the future. And my brother got really angry. So then he rang up my sister, and my sister got on the phone and said, yeah, I'll go and talk to dad. So my sister came, and I don't know what she said to, she said to dad, and dad said, okay. The next morning, the next day, at night, we're having dinner, and then dad said, all right, you go there for two months. Coming back here. Because who's going to look after your, own, your coconut plantation and my coconut plantation? Nobody's here. You're the only male here in our village. Uh, so all my other brothers were working in Kimbe and, and uh, Mosby, Lay and, and Wewek and, and all this place, Mount Hagen. I said, okay, okay, deal. So I went to Mosby. So I went and collect my coconut and with my cousins and collect them. And, you know, obviously we we cut them and, uh, and, and put it in a famine tree and put it on a truck, about 22 bags, brought it down to Kimbe, uh, sold it. It was... 3,200 3, kina. And I was, I was so, so over the money. I, I came back and I said to, I said to dad, dad, um, it's 3,200. Okay. During the time, any guinea from Hoskins to Mosby was 240 kina. And um, I said, so he's counting the money, he's got the money, he's counting the money, 240 kina. That's for the air fares. Okay, from... Ulamona to to the airport, we will have to hire a car, so it's 80 kina. So he's put out 80 kina, and that's how we did it. And this money, now that's yours, but you haven't paid the boys who help you. I said, yeah, okay, how much I'll pay them? He said, I don't know. you got to ask them. So I brought my cousins in and said, how much will you know, everyone? Was? So I gave them 50 kina. 50 kina was massive during our time. Mm-hmm. They were over the moon, you know. They straight away, next day, they went to Biala to go and spend that money in Biala. So that was good. And I said, okay, I'll I'll come on Thursday. And my brother said, no, come on Friday because then you can go straight and see the Paga Panthers train and then you come and see the Saturday uh, B-grade plate and then Sunday. And that's what we did. Yeah. When I came to Mosby, I was, after I watched the game, I didn't sleep that Sunday night because I was so scared. The, the guys were bigger, and I got massive beard, massive beards, <laughs> and ugly looking guys. You know, <laughs> ugly looking guys, and I said, "This guy's gonna kill me." <laughs> you know, rugby league in Papua New Guinea is you gotta be the man to play that game. Yeah, and I said, "You got Steve. I'm, you can see that Steve. I'm coming in and connecting into your face, um, man." And 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 playing in Biela Biela League is a guy. You know. You're, you're running the ball up and you look at him and he's, he's looked at him and he's gone. His arms are like this and his, and his mouth is like... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know when you see that, you need to have... You need to suddenly... If you don't know how to step, suddenly you go to develop a stepping... 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 Yeah. Uh, stepping culture in, in yeah. your brain to step out of that because if you run through... The, if he's holding his arm like that, you're dead. You know? You'll be lying on the ground, and the, and the referee will say, play on. He'll be going on the bed. Anyway. All right. Um, awesome. Um, mate, Marcus, I could talk to you for hours <laughs> and hours <laughs> on these topics, and I I would love to have you on again next time because sure. uh, there's a few topics we didn't cover. Uh, it's the, you know, we're talking about your uh, kumuls, uh, your time in the kumuls, and you know, several other topics that uh, uh, I know that people will enjoy um, hearing from you. So, I just want to thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you for your insights, your stories. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot more about you that I didn't know, <laughs> and I appreciate that. And this this is an episode I'm excited for a lot of people to listen to. So you know, thank you for making the uh, trip from Gold Coast, and, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. No worries. I really do enjoy it, and um, it was good. I, obviously, David, thank you, and um, thank your wife as well for us and, um, and the family. Um I think it's it's by times things like the, the uh, stories like the, uh, like this goes out to to the young kids nowadays in back home obviously back home and and um, you know other kids that here and my kids as well they've never they've never heard these stories some of those stories like that so which is good so um, as soon as it comes out we'll be uh, playing it for them and uh, and and I won't watch it because I know I don't like <laughs> watching watching myself on uh, but anyway thank you so much appreciate your time awesome thanks Marcus. Thanks.